Good evening and welcome to the National Pancreas Foundation's 2021 Virtual Education Series. I'm Trisha O'Neill, the National Director of Chapter Development. The National Pancreas Foundation provides hope for those suffering from pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer through funding cutting edge research, advocating for new and better therapies, and providing support and education for patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Some of our featured programs include the Animated Pancreas Patient, state chapters that support education, fundraising, and patient support, and our physician programs that include research grants, medical education, and our annual uh, fellows symposium. Our success depends on the support of many individuals and organizations. You can make a difference by joining NPF as a volunteer, a sponsor, coordinating a fundraiser in your area, and sharing your own personal story. Check us out online for our fall National Pancreas Bowl fundraiser, which will be coming to a city near you. For more information, please email us at info at pancreasfoundation.org. Tonight's topic is pancreatic cancer, updates for patients and physicians. We wanna thank our friends at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And our format this evening will be two presentations followed by a patient perspective. Please use the Q&A section of our portal to ask your questions for this evening, and Dr. Lee will answer them along with the other presenters at the end of the program. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Kenneth Lee. Dr. Lee received his undergraduate education at Harvard University and then completed his medical degree and surgical training at the University of Chicago. He joined the faculty in the Department of Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh in 1988 and is now the Jane and Carl Citron Professor of Surgery, Vice Chair for Graduate Education, and the Program Director of General Surgery Residency Program at UPMC. He has received numerous teaching awards and annually has been named as Best Doctor in America. He has been involved in the care of patients in pancreatic diseases and pancreatic research for nearly 30 years and has been a friend to the National Pancreas Foundation for nearly 20 years. In 2014, Dr. Lee received NPF's, um, NPF's Courage Award. So we thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for joining us tonight and for all the uh, panelists on board tonight, thank you as well. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction and welcome to all of those of you who are joining us this evening. Thank you for uh, setting aside this time uh, to join us. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Amr Zerkat, uh, Dr. Alessandro Panicia, and the National Pancreas Foundation, I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's National Pancreas Foundation Virtual Education Program. And tonight's program is entitled Pancreas Cancer Updates for Patients and Physicians. Dr. Zerkat, Dr. Panicia, and I comprise the Pancreas Surgery Group at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. Uh, this is one of the largest pancreas surgery programs in the United States. Uh, we perform more than 250 pancreas operations annually. We work very closely with our colleagues in gastroenterology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, pathology, nutrition here at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. And together, all of us provide comprehensive multidisciplinary diagnosis and treatment of the full range of conditions of the pancreas, both benign and malignant, and in both children and in adults. And together, we are also at the forefront of research to better understand, diagnose, and treat benign and malignant diseases of the pancreas. Some of the advances that this group has made span a range of subjects and include the development of multimodality treatments for pancreatic cancer, um, as well as the identification of molecular fingerprints that help us to determine whether surgery or observation of a pancreatic abnormality may be most appropriate. Uh, we've also established the largest robotic pancreatic surgery program in the United States and identified the genetic basis for some forms of pancreatitis. Annually, we see nearly 400 patients with newly diagnosed and possibly surgical, uh, surgically treatable pancreatic uh, cancers. This is in addition to, unfortunately, many patients who already have advanced disease uh, when diagnosed who go directly to medical oncologists. Uh, we see these potentially surgically treatable patients in our weekly multidisciplinary outpatient clinic, during which patients with newly diagnosed pancreatic cancers are seen by our team of surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and others. 
And with this approach, we're able to efficiently provide and implement a treatment plan for our patients. We also have a weekly pancreatic cancer tumor board where we uh, follow up uh, the progress of our patients uh, and, and are able to reach consensus recommendations as to next steps in their treatment. This evening's focus is on pancreatic cancer and we'll begin with a presentation by Dr. Zerkat. Dr. Zerkat received his medical education at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And after completing his general surgery residency training at the University of Chicago, he then completed his surgical oncology fellowship program here at the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. His uh, tremendous skills, his abilities, his knowledge, his uh, wonderful uh, relationships with patients and his great potential to truly be a leader in, in um, the field of surgical oncology and pancreatic disease were widely recognized uh, by our faculty when he was finishing his fellowship. And we were quite fortunate that he decided to join us uh, as he had many opportunities elsewhere. Um, and so he joined our faculty. His accomplishments over the past decade are truly extraordinary. During this time, he's focused on pancreatic surgery and diseases in general, and in particular on pancreatic uh, cancer. During this short period of time, he's uh, clearly risen uh, to the upper levels of, uh, of scholars and surgeons focusing on pancreatic surgery and pancreatic cancer, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. And indeed, uh, surgeons from around the world come to our institution uh, to study and learn under Dr. Zerkas' tutelage. Uh, in recognition of his accomplishments, uh, he holds now one of the endowed chairs uh, at UPMC and is perhaps uh, the youngest person in our department uh, to be uh, given uh, that, that very distinct honor of, of holding an endowed chair. He's also the chief of, of uh, surgical oncologic services throughout the UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and, and he is the person who leads our, our very extensive uh, clinical pancreas cancer and surgery program, as well as our extensive pancreas research program. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Zerkat, who will be our first speaker tonight. And he will speak to us uh, on the subject of multimodality treatment of pancreatic cancer. Dr. Zerkat. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I think the only thing that Dr. Lee did not mention in his kind words was that I was trained by him. Um, thank you for the kind words. Um, just gonna try to share my screen here. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Great, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Trish, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for the uh, NPF for providing us with this platform to uh, uh, discuss latest advances in pancreatic uh, cancer surgery. Um, uh, obviously we are indebted to our patients who are, uh, I'm sure many of them are on the line today. Um, uh, for, for all their uh, sacrifice and hard work. And, uh, and we very much appreciate the partnership we've, we've had with the NPF in treating our patients. Uh, so I'm gonna discuss multimodality treatment of operable pancreatic cancer. This is a vast topic and we have 20 minutes to do so. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna gear this uh, mostly really towards our patients, uh, try to provide them with a rationale of why we do what we do um, in terms of uh, chemotherapy and, and the timing of chemotherapy as it relates to surgery. And then Dr. Panicia will come on and discuss some of the advances in surgical technique uh, for our patients. I have no disclosures. Um, I think it's always uh, fit to start uh, a discussion on pancreatic cancer with a sobering slide. This is uh, from arguably one of the best cancer centers um, uh, worldwide from Memorial Sloan Kettering, a, a review of, uh, of three decades worth of pancreatic cancer. This is a survival curve for the 80s in blue and the 90s in yellow and the 2000s in green. And you, unfortunately, over three decades um, at, at one of the premier institutions uh, worldwide, uh, the survival for pancreatic cancer has stayed stagnant uh, at a dismal uh, two years or just under uh, two years. And there are many reasons for this, uh, for this but um, if you can imagine that if this is occurring at one of the major centers, um, uh, it must be lower uh, in some of the more community-based centers. So uh, we've had this for three decades. However, some recent data um, uh, on the horizon shows that, that there is uh, some hope. 
Uh, this is data from PanCan that shows that the five-year survival rate has slowly etched up over the course of the last decade. This number is 10%. It's low. It's still, there's a lot of work for us to do. But this uh, number is deceiving in the sense that it, it takes in all comers, uh, metastatic and operable pancreatic cancers. Unfortunately, a majority of our patients do present with metastatic disease, and we don't have a chance to, to, uh, to get to meet them and uh, for them to undergo surgery. But that 10% is for all newcomers. When you look at patients who have uh, operable pancreatic cancer, that number rises to about 30 to 35% at five years, which is really a major feat. But we are slowly moving forward. The reasons for the poor survival for pancreatic cancer is that most of our operations uh, have been understaged. Uh, most of these resections that we do for, for cancer for a long time were done with us removing the tumor but uh, leaving residual cells behind. That's a concept known as a positive margin resection or an R1 resection. So leaving a cancer behind, a single cancer cell behind is likely going to lead to a recurrence and a poor survival. The second problem with pancreatic cancer is that it's a systemic disease. Even when we do not see any metastatic disease on CAT scans or MRIs or PET scans, uh, this cancer has a propensity to spread early and there are satellite cells in the bloodstream. So for a long time, we did not recognize that. We, uh, we really now have the notion that pancreatic cancer is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we can see the tip of the iceberg on a CAT scan, but what we have to treat is what's underneath the water and that's really uh, the systemic disease. And we've had no good chemotherapy options up until the last decade. Uh, and when we had those options, we really never uh, knew when to use them, after surgery or before surgery or a combination of both. And then finally, post-operative morbidity. For those of you who've undergone surgery, a Whipple operation, you know that these operations are tough. It's hard to bounce back and receive chemotherapy after a major surgery like the Whipple. So these are probably some of the three main reasons why pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer, at least operable pancreatic, pancreatic cancer, uh, has uh, failed to demonstrate any survival uh, uh, improvement over the course of the last three decades in that uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering paper. This is the pancreas, uh, as, as many of our patients may have seen diagrams drawn in clinic or online. Uh, it, it's a tough organ to, to work around because it's all the way nestled in the back of the abdominal cavity near your spine near the aorta, and you can see these blood vessels, just a nest of blood vessels surrounding this organ. Uh, above the organ are the small intestines, the colon, the stomach. Uh, so this, this, uh, this organ really has the propensity to, to, to spread early, these cancers spread early, and they're in a difficult location. And whenever we do major surgery, we have to be very respectful of some of these blood vessels around the pancreas. A, because these tumors do spread to those blood vessels and often line those blood vessels, but also these blood vessels are essential for function, even for life. So operating on, on this is, is rather tre treacherous and requires a lot of meticulous detail. When we see patients in clinic, we talk about resectability. Um, not all operable pancreatic cancers are the same. Obviously metastatic ones are ones that have stage four disease, and those are really not surgical candidates most of the time. Operable cancer, however, comes in two different uh, flavors. It's really the straightforward uh, uh, operations that we do for, for pancreatic cancer or the ones that are, have tumors involving blood vessels. And this is a picture of a CT scan of, a, of, a, of one of our patients. And you can see here, there's a lot of uh, busy uh, structures on the scan. But if I can focus your attention to what's in this red box, you see the tumor located in uh, dark gray with a central necrotic cent center. And there's a biliary stent, a plastic biliary stent. That's that white spot in this area. And then next to it are two big blood vessels. One of them is a vein and one of them is an artery. That's the portal vein. And uh, the one next to it is the superior mesenteric artery. And I would submit to you that this relationship between the tumor and these blood vessels determines if we're gonna leave tumor behind at the time of surgery. So there are two different uh, uh, classifications. There's resectable and there's borderline resectable disease. In resectable pancreatic cancer, the surgeon is likely gonna undergo, uh, undergo a, a Whipple for a patient who has this big tumor that's between those large arrows. But you see here that there's a nice space between the tumor and those two blood vessels. This is resectable disease. There's really no impingement on these blood vessels. 
a well done Whipple by an experienced surgeon is likely going to result in a margin negative resection. That is no cancer cells left behind. However, take a look at this picture on the right side. This is a borderline resectable tumor. Borderline because it may be removable. However, you can see that the tumor here touches the vein, but also nearly, nearly encompasses 180 degrees of this artery. And here you can see that if a surgeon tries to go in, in order to preserve these blood vessels, it, like, it will likely leave tumor behind at the level of those blood vessels and obviously leading to a survival that's diminished because of recurrence of cancer. It is these tumors uh, that need some sort of downstaging so that we can, uh, we can enable patients to undergo a margin negative, potentially curative resection. And how do we get to this stage? Well, we used to, uh, we used to do it really <laughs> quite bluntly uh, by taking patients to the operating room. Um, in the absence of a very, very good scan, we would really get scans just looking at metastatic disease. We were not paying much attention to these blood vessels. But what we do is, is really elevate the head of the pancreas and with our fingers, try to guesstimate if the tumor is involving these blood vessels. And 50% of the time we were wrong and 50% of the time we were right. And that's really unacceptable for pancreatic cancer. And it's really this, this method of just going into the operating room and mobilizing and seeing what you have uh, and then burning bridges and proceeding with the operation and then ultimately finding out that you've left tumor behind. That's really the, the, the most difficult scenario for a surgeon um, uh, is, to, is to leave cancer behind. So there must be a better way for us to do this uh, other than by simply feeling uh, with the fingertips. And there's really two modalities that really have emerged in the last two decades, looking at um, the relationship of the tumor to blood vessels. The first is a triple phase pancreatic protocol CT scan. This is a CT scan that does have a few nuances in the sense that the slices are very thin. The contrast that's injected into the vein is injected and timed with the machine going through the slices at very discrete intervals so that we can see the relationship of the tumor to the vein and the tumor to the artery. And that's really very important, a triple phase pancreatic protocol CT. The second modality is what's known as an endoscopic ultrasound. Our patients may know it as EUS. That's where we have our gastroenterologists go down uh, into the esophagus, into the stomach and the duodenum and use an ultrasound probe to look at the tumor up close and personal. We can confirm if it's a pancreatic cancer or not, because in this area, there are other tumors that live around the area of the head of the pancreas, duodenal cancer, ampullary cancer, cholangiocarcinoma. It allows us to take a biopsy so that we could uh, potentially uh, give therapy up front. It gives us much more accurate information on tumor size. It tells us if the lymph nodes are involved and we can biopsy those lymph nodes, but also contributes to our assessment of whether the tumor abuts the vasculature, the, the, these two blood vessels that I just mentioned. Also in, the, in, the, in certain centers which use radiation therapy, this modality, endoscopic ultrasound, can leave a small marker, a bead, called the gold fiducial uh, for, the, for the administration of very targeted radiotherapy to the area of the tumor and around the blood vessel. So these have really become standard of care at major academic centers uh, for the treatment of pancreatic cancer and have contributed to us knowing a bit more about the relationship of the tumor and the blood vessels and whether we can extricate this tumor with a margin negative resection. And I'm not gonna go through this, this in much detail, but uh, University of Pittsburgh was really one of the first few centers that utilized the combination of CT and EUS in a predictive model to try to, to, try to predict who's gonna come up with a margin positive R1 resection or a margin negative resection. And we used a combination of criteria on endoscopic ultrasound and by CT scan. And we were able to classify patients accurately into high risk for margin positive or high risk for margin negative. And at Pittsburgh, we use this classification to give patients preoperative chemotherapy to try to shrink these tumors and achieve a margin negative resection. And in our data, we were successful in this endeavor. And for patients who had an R0 resection as predicted by CT scan, pancreas protocol, and by endoscopic ultrasound, you can see here the survival curves were completely different. 
it's almost a doubling of survival for patients who had a margin negative resec resection predicted by an endoscopic ultrasound and uh, by uh, pancreatic uh, CT protocol. So this is really the standard of care now is to undergo a CT scan with pancreas protocol and undergo an endoscopic ultrasound uh, for all of the reasons that I mentioned previously. So we just, I just summarized for you there uh, the, the nuances of, of operable pancreatic cancer and how we need to define who is margin negative and who is margin positive. Well, the second thing about pancreatic cancer is we've realized that it's a systemic disease and that we need chemotherapy in addition to surgery to be able to eradicate any systemic disease. Again, the concept of, uh, of, of you know, uh, treating the unknown or the, the, the cells that are circulating around the body. This slide here is relatively busy, but it summarizes almost three decades worth of chemotherapy that was given after pancreatic cancer surgery in Europe and the United States. And you can see here that we were using single agent regimens like 5-FU and gemcitabine. The problem with these agents was that they were not very effective. The response rate is about eight to 12% for either of those agents. And you can see on the right side here, this is the most important data for patients is the survival. You can see that the survival for patients who get adjuvant therapy is better. That is un that's really unequivocal. If you get adjuvant therapy, uh, survival is improved because of the treatment of systemic disease. However, I would submit to you that that survival is only three or four months. So we ask our patients and we ask ourselves, is it worthwhile getting six months of chemotherapy after a Whipple for a three month survival? And that's something that's really, um, that's really held us back. The fact that we don't have effective chemotherapy agents to improve survival. Well, fast forward to 2011 and 2012. We now have two separate regimens, one named gem abraxane, and these are multi-drug regimens, gemcitabine and abraxane, an agent that allows gemcitabine uh, to get into cells, cancer cells better and, and, uh, and is more cytotoxic. And then fulferinox on the right side here. Both of these multi-drug regimens, fulferinox is a combination of different agents, uh, and again, gemabraxine is a combination of two agents. When these were tested in the metastatic setting, those two agents against gemcitabine alone, the old data, those two agents doubled the survival of patients with pancreatic cancer. So now we had two potential multi-drug regimens that could treat patients, uh, double the survival over single drug regimens, and actually uh, had a response rate of somewhere between 30 and 40%. So um, the top part of the slide is the old data, single regimens, survival of about two years in the adjuvant setting. Adjuvant means post-operative. And now we come to the new era of, of, of better chemotherapy, more effective chemotherapy. And you can see that the survival is actually improving and we're now hitting numbers that are reaching three and four uh, plus years. The only thing I would caution our patients when looking at this data is that this data is highly selective. It means that patients could have undergone therapy uh, before surgery, reached surgery, survived obviously, and then uh, did not have a complication and were then able to tolerate six months of therapy. And those are the super selective patients. And there's not many of them actually. Not many patients are able to go through this entire regimen uh, and, and enjoy the benefits of prolonged chemotherapy, uh, multi-drug regimen. So it's very important that we look at this data in the sense that it's very, very selective. Uh, these are clinical trials that were in patients who were able to complete therapy. And that's really not helpful for most patients who walk into our clinic. Most patients who come into our clinic are gonna ask, how long are we gonna survive? And if we start going down the rabbit hole of looking at super selective cases, Yes, we may end up with four or five years, but that doesn't benefit the bigger denominator of patients. So it's important to, to remember this, this point that these are selective, selective uh, trials. The problem with adjuvant therapy is that it's hard to receive six months of therapy after a major operation such as a Whipple. This is really the, the main problem with it is that uh, a Whipple is associated with a, a significant complication rate and up to 50% of patients in the United States who have pancreatic cancer and undergo Whipples are not able to receive adjuvant therapy or 
in a significant number, they may start it, but they may get delayed or they may not finish the intended course of adjuvant therapy. So that's a big problem following major pancreatic uh, surgery. So uh, in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, this concept of adjuvant therapy, although accepted, uh, has really been turned upside down by neoadjuvant therapy, which is giving therapy upfront when patients are healthy. The reasons for neoadjuvant therapy are many, but I'm summarizing them here, and this is based on uh, phase one and phase two data. Uh, neoadjuvant therapy does decrease the rate of positive margins. As I showed you in the Pittsburgh data, uh, we improve survival that way. It does sterilize the lymph nodes as well. So if you have a patient who has a bulky tumor, it can shrink down, uh, you can get negative margins, and you can convert the lymph node positive disease to lymph node negative disease. It treats the, the disease that's not visible, the micrometastatic disease. It delivers chemotherapy and or radiation without delay. Those patients are healthy and they're able to receive therapy because they have not undergone an operation. It's important that it's also uh, a really a litmus test for drug sensitivity. If we give a patient neoadjuvant therapy in the form of a drug, a certain drug, then we know if it works or doesn't because we remove the specimen and we're able to look to see if the, if the chemo has actually had an effect on the specimen. And we may be able to give that drug afterwards in the adjuvant setting or even in the metastatic setting. So neoadjuvant therapy has many theoretical benefits. At Pittsburgh, we started using these two regimens, fulfurinox and gemabraxane, in the neoadjuvant setting. And we, uh, we really saw really good success. Again, we were using single agent regimens and we were getting two year survivorship, just like the Memorial Sloan Kettering data. Now we were using neoadjuvant therapy using fulfurinox and gemcitabine and abraxane. And for all newcomers, we were seeing a survival of three and a half years for either regimen. We, we, we think there's a hint that fulfurinox may be slightly better than gemabraxane, but both are effective uh, and both can be used uh, for patients, but the survival is better. Again, it's not the four or five years that you're seeing with the adjuvant trial because these are neoadjuvant, all newcomers that are coming in. A lot of them will drop off because of complications after surgery. And I think Alessandro We'll talk about some of these complications and, 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 and the ways in which really we're going to mitigate them with surgical techniques. So neoadjuvant therapy worked at, in the UPMC experience, but now there's data that neoadjuvant therapy works on a national level. The, this is 5,000 distal pancreatectomies. These are not even Whipples. These are the relatively straightforward left-sided pancreatic tumors. And when we look at national data for patients who undergo neoadjuvant therapy, versus upfront resection. And here we're doing a propensity matched analysis and we're trying to remove selection bias. You can see here that the margin positive resection rate is significantly lower with patients who undergo neoadjuvant therapy, 11% versus 18%. And that actually translates to improved survival. This was a paper that was published by Dr. Panicia uh, and really shows that neoadjuvant therapy, even for the straightforward tumors, not just the borderline resectable tumors, even for these, there is an improvement, a significant improvement in survival on multivariate analysis and on propensity matched analysis. At Pittsburgh, uh, we've gone uh, one step further. We've uh, summarized data from nearly 15,000 patients in 60 studies of neoadjuvant therapy. And this is what's called the Markov model, which allows us to test which uh, all the scenarios in which a patient starts therapy upfront with neoadjuvant therapy or undergo surgery first. And obviously there are many different directions that a patient's course can take. But when you account for all these courses, again, neoadjuvant therapy in this recently published uh, paper, uh, neoadjuvant therapy has a benefit over a surgery first approach. The benefit is not too huge. It's about five to six months in our, in our data, but importantly, we did this analysis on a base case scenario of a 60 year old patient from, from the, again, the 15,000 patients that we've, we've, we've uh, uh, collated, but also the analysis holds true for elderly patients. So even a 75 year old patient who receives neoadjuvant therapy, although they're older and they may not tolerate the therapy well, there is still a survival benefit for this. What's even more encouraging is that the NCCN now has neoadjuvant therapy as almost a requirement for borderline resectable tumors. This really was not there a few years ago. But what's even more encouraging is that for resectable cancers, these again, these are the tumors that, are, that can be resected with negative margins. 
even for these tumors, there is an option to proceed to surgery, but there's another option to also undergo neoadjuvant therapy. So th this is key. You look at the bottom box here, the NCCN does even recommend to undergo neoadjuvant therapy for high-risk patients who have resectable disease. So that's very important. Again, everyone uh, coming together on the, on the notion that there is systemic disease that's not known and not observed. So this is great. We have all this data on neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, we seem to think that it works. Well, does it really work in a randomized trial? This is a very important recent trial, multi-institutional SWOG trial that was just uh, published looking at gemcitabine abraxane versus fulferinox in the neoadjuvant setting and the adjuvant setting. Three months neoadjuvant, three months adjuvant. And a couple of important things about this very important trial. Number one, both fulferinox and gemabraxane were equally effective. They had the same survival. But disappointingly, if I can draw your attention to the right side of this, of this screen, uh, this survival is still two years. It is not what we thought it would be. It's still two years. And this is again, truncated, but again, uh, disappointing. We, were, we would have expected this to be a bit higher. This trial was very important because it showed us that fulferinox and gemabraxane can be given safely. Uh, they're probably equivalent in terms of efficacy, but that the survival remains low. And again, this whole concept is these are patients who are walking in to clinic and undergoing neoadjuvant therapy. That's their true survival from the time of, uh, of walking into clinic and having a diagnosis. So how do we improve the survival? Well, I would submit to you that we need to identify predictors of benefit for neoadjuvant therapy. Maybe not everyone benefits from the same type of neoadjuvant therapy. Can we have a biomarker that guides if neoadjuvant therapy is effective before we go into the operating room? We should be able to test the efficacy of neoadjuvant therapy prior to undergoing surgery. And finally, can we come to a, a, uh, a uh, scenario where we can give all of the chemotherapy upfront and not have to deliver any adjuvant therapy after surgery? And this has really been um, our work at the University of Pittsburgh for the last uh, five years or so. And I know uh, this is a busy slide and I apologize for it, but I wanted to show you here that this is data from the University of Pittsburgh, patients with resectable and borderline resectable pancreatic cancer who received neoadjuvant therapy, all newcomers who received neoadjuvant therapy. And there's an interesting, uh, in interesting set of uh, analyses here. The blue lines in each of these four graphs are patients who have received surgery up front. The, the red line is the neoadjuvant therapy. And I want to draw your attention to the CA-19-9, this biomarker. If the CA-19-9 is elevated, then patients benefit from neoadjuvant therapy. You can see there's a separation of the curves and the separation of the curves becomes even greater if the CA-19-9 level is higher. But look at this first curve. Patients who have a CA-19-9 that's low seem to have worse survival with neoadjuvant therapy. So interesting concept here that maybe we can start selecting who benefits from neoadjuvant therapy and who benefits the most from neoadjuvant therapy by looking at a very simple blood test, the CA-19-9. Well, we took this one step further at UPMC and we started thinking about bringing down the tumor marker as much as possible. How can we maximize the efficacy of neoadjuvant therapy for those patients who are CA199 producers? And in our data set, it seemed like patients who have CA199 normalization, that is a high CA199 that comes down to a normal level, seem to enjoy the benefits of neoadjuvant therapy the most. They had smaller tumors at the end of the day, they had a higher uh, lymph node negative uh, uh, rate, and they had higher percentage of R0 resection, and they enjoyed better survival. So that's a, an easy biomarker, the CA199, that we can target, and we want to normalize it. But even one step further in our data was that the fact that the patients who received CA199, all newcomers, underwent surgery, but had a normalization of their CA199, those patients, it seems, did not benefit from any adjuvant therapy on the back end. Again, slides A and C are together here. I know this is busy, but for patients who have a CA-99 that did not normalize in 
graph A, you can see that adjuvant therapy in, in yellow is beneficial over, over no adjuvant therapy in blue. But look at slides B and D here. These are patients who have a CA199 that was high and fell below the normal value of 37. Look at these curves, they're superimposed. Adjuvant therapy does not seem to benefit patients who have a normalization in their CA199. This is very prelim data, it's published, it needs to be validated. So uh, last few slides is, is really what we're doing at Pittsburgh. This is uh, this concept that we have to chase the CA199 to bring it down as much as we can. We cannot be married to one regimen or the other. We have to be able to switch regimens to be able to get the CA199 down as much as we can. So at Pittsburgh, we've been doing this for a while now. We gauge response to new adjuvant therapy by tumor marker response and by pathologic response. And we decide on the adjuvant chemotherapy regimen based on the CA199 response and the pathologic response. This is a term that we, uh, we've coined as dynamic or adaptive therapy. And this is really, uh, these patients enjoy an improvement in survival. Again, it's not massive, but you can see here that these patients are surviving three and a half or four years after surgery, almost a doubling over that initial slide that I showed you. Again, the concept that not everyone benefits in the same way and that we should be chasing new adjuvant therapy in a dynamic fashion. So this is the proposed trial we have at UPMC. Uh, this is something that we're gonna start in a multi-institutional fashion. We're gonna give patients full Farinox to begin with. Patients who respond with a CA199 change are gonna be excluded and they're gonna be continuing on full Farinox. But those who don't respond, we're gonna switch them to gemabraxane and see if we continue gemabraxane on the adjuvant end, are these patients gonna benefit from therapy or not? Uh, this is a brief schema of our, our, of our multidisciplinary clinic that Dr. Lee mentioned. Patients come into our multidisciplinary clinic on day zero. They have a CT scan that's a triphasic one, an endoscopic ultrasound with a biopsy and a CA199. We give them two month increments of neoadjuvant therapy, gemabraxane or, or fulferinox. But importantly, we restage them with a CA199 and a CT scan. And if there's no response by CA199, we'll switch the chemo regimen. We'll then, do, we'll, we'll then do a robotic operation for these patients most of the time if we can, if the anatomy is favorable. And then we deliver adjuvant therapy based on the efficacy of neoadjuvant therapy. This is our multidisciplinary clinic. Uh, our patients uh, who we are indebted uh, to come in from all over, travel long distances. It's a, it's a clinic that uh, I'm sure is, is at all of the major academic centers for pancreatic cancer, but it's a one-stop shop for all our patients. They see everyone on the same day. Um, and you know, this obviously we have, we've got a lot of scientific work to, ahead of us because not every patient produces CA199. Uh, about 35% of patients don't. And for those, we need to find a biomarker that's best suited for them if they don't have a CA199 uh, elevation at, uh, at diagnosis. And there's a lot of work here coming from Hopkins and, uh, and other institutions, including Pittsburgh and Alessandro Panicia's tumor DNA in the bloodstream that really uh, is, is, might be a good marker for those patients. So in summary, um, accurate preoperative staging of pancreatic cancer allows for successful treatment. Uh, we have this concept and others uh, as well that adaptive dynamic neoadjuvant therapy using a simple biomarker like CA199 can allow us to decide who benefits from neoadjuvant therapy CA199 normalization is an important thing that we should strive for. We should switch regimens and give more chemo if a patient can tolerate it so we can get to that, almost that, uh, uh, that magical number of normalization. And then potentially, if you normalize your CA199, you may not need any adjuvant therapy on the back end. And this is something that we're working to validate uh, here uh, at Pittsburgh. We also need further work on biomarkers in patients who do not have a CA199 at diagnosis. But I've, I've hope, uh, I hope I've given you a bit of a, um, a whirlwind of, of what we're doing for multimodality therapy and the importance of accurate staging for pancreatic cancer and the importance of multimodality chemotherapy and really precision-based chemotherapy for patients with pancreatic cancer. Thank you again uh, all and uh, would be happy to take any questions at the uh, end of Alessandro's talk. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zerkat. I think that was just a remarkable presentation.
um, showing us the evolution of how we take care of patients. Uh, I recall when I started out, uh, my hand was there feeling the blood vessels, just like you showed in that picture. And now we have, have made remarkable progress, much of which uh, you have, have been instrumental in. Uh, our, our next presentation is, is from um, our, our colleague, Dr. Alessandro Peniccia. Dr. Peniccia uh, completed his medical education at the Premier Medical School in Rome, Italy, and then came to the United States and he completed his surgical training at Johns Hopkins and the University of Colorado. Uh, during his residency training, he also took time out to uh, to be a global uh, clinical scholar at uh, Harvard Medical School, and also pursued a research fellowship in tumor immunology at uh, the University of Colorado. Uh, fortunately, at that point, when he finished his residency, he decided he, he decided he wanted to become a surgical oncologist. And we were fortunate that he, like Dr. Zerkat, decided to enter into the, uh, the complex surgical oncology fellowship program at the University of Pittsburgh. And so from 2017 to 2019, he uh, came through the fellowship and, and like, like Dr. Zerkat, you know, he just shined and it took a little bit of persuasion. Uh, he, was, he was due to go back to Colorado, but I think he realized that, that Pittsburgh was the place where there was great opportunity, where there was great support, there was infrastructure um, uh, and, and we wanted him. And so uh, Dr. Pinicha has, has been with us for the last two years. Uh, he too has been extraordinarily productive. Um, with such a short uh, career, he already has almost 50 uh, peer-reviewed publications. Um, as Dr. Zerk had just alluded to, he's doing some really remarkable basic and translational science research. Um, the way I look, as I step back here, I see you know, I see Dr. Pinichia being where Dr. Zerkat was 10 years ago and, and 10 years from now, I suspect, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna see the same kind of, of extraordinary accomplishments. Uh, we, we spoke earlier about uh, University of Pittsburgh being really the center for robotic pancreatic surgery in the United States. And, and despite um, his relative youth, Dr. Pinichia uh, is really a master of robotic surgery. And so he's gonna talk to us now about surgical techniques um, uh, um, advances in surgical techniques and, and robotic uh, pancreatic surgery. Dr. Pinicia. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. That was uh, very, very kind. Uh, the last thing, again, you forgot to mention that I both was trained by Dr. Lee and by Dr. Zurichat, just for completeness. So I am uh, going to try to share my screen. Please let me know if you can see it. Dr. Lee, can you see it? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah. All right, great. So again, thank you to the MPF for this invitation, for all our patients that are participating tonight. Uh, truly a remarkable uh, presentation by Dr. Zorica about the advances in systemic therapy. My talk is uh, primarily focused on technique. Uh, now you hear all about what chemotherapy can do for the tumor, how it's gonna prolong your survival, but Truthfully, uh, there is no chance to cure unless the tumor is removed. Uh, life can be prolonged with chemotherapy, sometimes with radiation combined with chemotherapy, but the tumor must be removed to achieve what we all hope, that 10% of very long-term survival. So my talk is primarily focused towards patient and uh, I'll take this opportunity to go through some of the questions that I'm asked uh, weekly in our multidisciplinary clinic. First of all, what are the operations? Uh, primarily, there are two main operations. One is the pancreatic odontectomy, and the, uh, the other operation that we do for pancreatic cancer is a distal pancreatectomy. Between these two, there is a total pancreatectomy option, but we will not talk about that today. How do we decide what operation to do? So it really depends on where the tumor is located. So a pancreatic odontectomy is best suited for a tumor that is located in the pancreatic head, as, as you see in this picture. A distal pancreatectomy is best suited for a tumor that is located in the distal part of the tail. We usually describe the pancreas as a fish for simplicity with a head, a neck, a body, and a tail. Now, the second question I always receive is why for a tumor that is located in a single organ, you have to remove so many parts of the body, the stomach, the duodenum, the gallbladder, the bile duct, and so forth. 
that has to do with how the organ develops during embryogenesis and for the important relationship that there are between the pancreas, the duodenum, the blood vessel, and mostly the lymph node. The Whipple, in fact, has a two phases operation, uh, different than the distal pancreatectomy. There is a first phase of resection where the head of the pancreas is removed with the bile duct, the gallbladder, a loop of duodenum, and a very small piece of stomach, about, about five centimeters or so. Then there is a second phase, which is the phase of reconstruction. And I think in this phase of the reconstruction is really when the advancement in technique, including robotics, have really uh, allowed us to decrease our complication rate and morbidity and length of stay and so forth. But as you see in the picture on the right, the reconstruction really entails reuniting the pancreas that is left behind with the intestine, the bile duct again with the intestine, and then the stomach again with the intestine. So having said, so what are the surgical goals of a, of a pancreas operation? So number one and foremost is removal of the entire tumor with negative margins. What that really means for us is removal of all tumor, including all cells within one millimeter of the area of transection. And this millimeter is, is really critical for us. It makes the difference between a complete resection, that's what we strive for, which is a partial resection. And the impact of that is in survival. Operations that are done with an R0 resection with greater than one millimeter margin pertain the best survival possible following an operation. What other goals do we have then is minimizing complication. As you are, all our patients know, a Whipple is a complex operation that is associated with some morbidity. So our goal is mainly to min minimize these three major complication, bleeding, pancreatic leak, and late gastric emptying. And I am bringing this complication to the talk because it's really hard to discuss what are the advancement and the benefit of robotic surgery without pointing out what are the pitfalls of the operation. So briefly, a pancreatic leak, which is our most fear complication, is leakage of fluid between the connection created between the pancreas and the intestine. Now, not all pancreatic leak are created equal. Most of the leak that we encounter are unconsequential. They're really named biochemical leak. We are aware that there is leakage from this connection, but it carries no consequence to the overall outcome, to the patient recovery time and so forth. What is really meaningful for us are these other two, uh, grade B and grade C. These are something that we call clinical relevant pancreatic fistula, meaning that there is a change in how the course of the patient while in hospital, while recovery is. And most of the time that means uh, insertion on a new drain and in the worst case scenario, uh, op reoperation the second complication that uh, it's common after this operation is delayed gastric emptying. Uh, for a patient, what that means is inability to tolerate a, uh, a regular food or solid food within one week, two weeks, or three weeks from the operation. Now, this complication, we dedicated uh, much attention, especially with the robotic technique. As, I, you can, as you can see on the right side of the slide, we spend countless hours uh, reviewing videos or robotic whipples, understanding why this complication happens and what are the factors that can be uh, done to mitigate. And after, after our research, we identify two or three key points and now we apply routinely to our operation with improved outcomes. That brings us to the robotic surgery why this platform is important and why it's taking place in the field of pancreatic surgery throughout the United States and per se throughout the world. A few key points here. The robotic platform allows for a three-dimensional uh, visualization of the ad abdominal structure. It basically simulates an open surgery. We have ability to see in, uh, in depth and in a higher definition and magnification. Also, the robotic instruments allow us to have great degree of motion with our wrists to allow for very fine dissection, both during the resection phase, but also during the reconstruction. Uh, this part is, uh, is really interesting, the tremor elimination, not the surgery tremor <laughs> while they do surgery, but any help you can have to achieve finesse is welcome during the operation. The robot allows you to have really uh, still hands in any component of the operation. 
Now, those benefits of the robotic platform are not automatic. Uh, you can just implement a robotic program and expect that the robot brings all the best outcomes possible just because of the technology. It takes time and it takes adjustment. Uh, what you see here is the graph from University of Pittsburgh uh, when the robotic surgery was first implemented in our hospital. It went through uh, three phases. The first phase is really understanding the platform. That took us about 80 robotic operations for pancreas, which is a great number of operations. In the second phase, we had a phase of adjustment. We understood the uh, technology, the platform, the steps of the operation now robotically, and progressively, we increased the complexity of the case. And finally, after about 140 cases, we really started to see the optimization, which means the, the, the technique is now uh, well standardized, can be taught, can be reproduced, and the outcome are uh, um, above or at least standard. Now, I want to go through this video just to give you an idea of what really a robotic Whipple uh, entails. So this is the beginning of the operation is the stomach. The pancreas uh, leaves behind the stomach in a space called the retroperitoneum. So the first step of the operation is really mobilizing all the organs that are covering the pancreas. So you can see these are the robotic instrument uh, dividing the tissue and the stomach is then divided. And then the lymph nodes are retrieved you can see uh, the uh, robotic hook instrument on the right side dissecting around blood vessel. Then the vascular to, to, to the pancreas is uh, divided. Now something that most of our patients are familiar with is the bile duct. The bile duct obstruction is the cause why patients develop jaundice and it's usually the location where the stent is placed. You can see here how this uh, bile duct is dissected robotically. And then uh, divided. Now, after this initial phase, finally the pancreas is dissected. This is uh, the pancreas that you are visualizing now. A space is created underneath the pancreas. And then using the robotic scissor, the pancreatic gland can be transected. Now you see some fluid and that is uh, the entrance into the pancreatic duct. and then the gland can be completely divided. Now, in this case, the tumor is on the left side. This is a pancreatic head tumor. We usually use, utilize a stent during this operation, which is different than the stent that is placed at the time of diagnosis. This stent usually migrates after the reconstruction. So there is no need for the stent to be removed. What you see here is the uh, structure Dr. Zurich had uh, mentioned during his talk, the, those important vessels, the vein and the artery. Right now you are visualizing on the right side, the superior mesenteric vein. This is the, the uh, limiting step for determining resectability. As you can see here, the robot really allows you for a fine, fine dissection. Layer after layer, the pancreas can be separated from the, uh, from the superior mesenteric vein. Okay, a small vessel originating from the superior mesenteric vein can be controlled with relatively ease using the robotic platform. And then finally, the last attachment of the pancreas can be separated. This really completes the dissection phase of the operation. Now the pancreas and the containing the, the lesion, the cancer have been separated from the rest of the structure in the body. Now, what about the second phase of the reconstruction? Here is really where the robotic platform allows for superior control of all the connection. 
Now, the first reconstruction phase begins with reconnecting the pancreas to the intestine. This is really done by hand uh, using sutures. This is our a standard way of reconstructing the pancreas. These are silk tie connecting the gland to the intestine. Now a little enterotomy, a hole in the intestine is made, and this will be used to reconnect the pancreatic duct to the intestine itself. Now, this is the area where the leak can occur. As I showed at the beginning of the talk, this is the Achilles heel of the operation. This connection is critical for optimal outcomes during the recovery phase. You can see how the, the connection are very fine. The, the stent now is placed inside the intestine, and this, as I said before, will migrate on its own. No need to be uh, retrieved. Usually migrates after a few days from the surgery. And then a final layer of silk is uh, positioned on the superior aspect of the pancreas to complete the connection. Now, the second anastomosis that is done is the connection between the bile duct to the intestine. Uh, that's what you see now is the biliary system and then an enterotomy made inside a loop of jejunum. And then again, the bile duct is sutured to the intestine. This is a special suture that are used during robotic surgery. These are uh, barbed suture. They have little flaps along the entire uh, length of the suture. You can see how the, uh, the instrument tissue allows for complete uh, manipulation of the needle with a uh, rotation. Which really increase precision for this anastomosis. Now the last anastomosis is the reconnection between the stomach and the intestine. What you see in the superior portion of this image is the stomach and inferior is the intestine. This is again sutured together. Then an opening is made in the stomach and then the opening is again sutured to the intestine and this creates the new channel. Right, and this is the completion of the anastomosis. So here at Pittsburgh, we have done a, over 800 cases of robotic pancreatic duodenectomy. And I wanna share with you uh, our outcome for the last 100 cases. So this program started in the early uh, 2010, now uh, has been in place for over 11 years. Over uh, the last 100 cases, as you can see here, about 50% were done for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And it's important to mention this because the dissection phase, the first part of the video that I show you for adenocarcinoma requires a uh, great expertise, but also is increased level of difficulty because of the involvement of the, of the vein usually during this operation. The operation is done in general within six hours with a range between six, seven, some are done with uh, even in five hours. 
Blood loss during the operation is approximately 200 milliliter. An important concept is the concept of conversion. Uh, what conversion means is an operation that as intended to be completed robotically is converted to a open classic laparotomy. Over time, what we have found, our conversion rate is about 5%, which means for every 100 cases, about five cases will require a conversion to a classic operation, either because of difficulty of dissection or complication. As we, we go back to the complication rate, this grade B and C fistula, this is the uh, clinically significant leak from the pancreatic connection. Our rate with robotic is now down to 3%. And we cannot talk about WIPO without mentioning a risk of mortality. This is a, a complex operation uh, that does have a risk of mortality, but our mortality within three months of the operation is uh, approximately 3%, which is out or below the national average. Our length of stay is approximately seven days. So from the date of the operation, patients are able to be discharged home within seven days. And our margin negative resection rate is approximately 85%. And this is that a resection with two more, uh, less, uh, more than one millimeter distance from the transaction margin. Now, what is robotic surgery in the national uh, landscape? So you see the slides is a, is a busy bar graph, but it separates the different approach, different technique to a pancreatic odonectomy. On the left side, the robotic platform, in the middle, the laparoscopic platform, and then on the right side, the classic open uh, laparotomy approach. Is that you can see the majority of the operation are still done as of 2018 in an open fashion, over about 3,000 cases. But if you know the uh, robotic platform has been slightly increasing over the last eight years, going from a handful of cases in 2010 when, we, uh, when the program was uh, initiated at the University of Pittsburgh, now representing about 200 or 300 cases in 2018. And it's in continuous rise, but still it's just a minority of cases done nationally. For the reason I showed you before, the, the long uh, learning curve and proficiency that is required. Now, what about the distal pancreatectomy? Distal pancreatectomy as just a resection phase is a tumor located in the distal part of the pancreas. A common question from patients is why does the spleen uh, have to be removed? And there are many reasons for that, but in the setting of pancreatic cancer, it mostly to do with retrieval of a proper number of lympho nodes around the pancreas. Uh, we use lympho nodes as a staging uh, marker for pancreatic cancer, and the hilum of the spleen, which is the area where the blood vessel from the spleen, from the spleen enter the uh, spleen itself, is rich of lympho node. So the spleen is commonly removed from pancreatic cancer. I want to share this slide for you. This is a bit technical, but uh, I feel that it's in this operation that the robotic platform really advances the technique in this operation called RAMPS. RAMPS is a uh, advanced distal pancreatectomy. It requires removal of the tissue between the pancreas and the kidney itself. And the reason why this is important is to achieve the negative margin resection that we talked about before. In this area, there are uh, many small vessels leading to the kidney. Uh, using the robot, the dissection in the area is uh, extremely facilitated. Similar study we had done for a distal pancreatectomy. This is data from PISPOR from the implementation of robotic distal pancreatectomy. This is a simpler, relatively simpler operation for the learning curve years was shorter required us about 40 cases to achieve uh, proficiency. And then from 40 to 100, we went through a phase of optimization. And uh, just a video on the technique here. This is a shorter video, as the operation is in general relatively uh, shorter. Again, the pancreas still lives behind the stomach, so the stomach has to be mobilized, and now the pancreas is uh, identified. The first step here is to identification of the blood vessel to the spleen, uh, namely the splenic artery. Again, the robotic uh, hook can be utilized to dissect the splenic artery, then the splenic artery is encircled and can be transected with a stapling device. This ensures complete sealing of the artery itself. The second step again is to create a uh, pancreatic tunnel. So the pancreas is elevated from the retroperitoneum in this case, the uh, tumor lesion is on the right side of the screen towards the spleen. 
Now, once the pancreas is uh, completely elevated from the uh, splenic vein, then as you can see, it will be encircled. And then can be transected in this case with a stapling device. This will transect the gland and control also the pancreatic duct to prevent any leakage of pancreatic fluid. And, and now the splenic vein is isolated. And then in similar technique is encircled and then transected. Here is the final phase of the uh, operation, which entails removal of the pancreas from the retroperitoneal uh, tissue, in particular, the tissue that overlies the left kidneys. You can see here the tumor is on the, uh, on the left side here, is in the inferior edge of the pancreas. Therefore, in this operation, we take great care of removing all the surrounding tissue. Here you start to see the renal artery at the bottom of the, uh, of the screen which we use this as a landmark to assure that all the surrounding tissue has been removed with the pancreas to obtain negative margin. And you started to see the spleen in the screen and the kidney at the bottom of the picture. Now in the last few bites, the spleen is uh, detached from its surrounding attachment to the abdominal wall and the retroperitoneum. And this all become the surgical specimen that will be evaluated for margin, tumor extent, and lymph node. The last step of the operation requires placement of a surgical drain. This drain will collect all the fluid or any potential leakage from the uh, transected margin. And that concludes the operation. This is the transected pancreatic margin with the transected pancreatic vein. Now, what has been our experience with this pancreatectomy? This is a, uh, now a, a relatively old paper from 2015. And at the time we had already completed about a hundred uh, distal pancreatectomy. Here you can see our experience. That's why the learning curve is really important achieving proficiency before implementing the program. As you can see, the, OR, the operative time for our initial 40 cases was about 300 minutes, almost four hours now, down consistently over uh, about two or three hours. Estimated blood loss for this operation is about 150 millimeter. A conversion rate is about 3% in our latest series. Mortality for our first 100 cases was zero. Reoperation rate about 1%. And when we look down to uh, pancreatic leak B and C, so these are the clinically significant, about 11%, so 10 patient over 100. Median length of stay for this operation is about five days. This is our updated series on digital pancreatectomy, specifically for uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And we can see in the last 100 cases, now this is updated to 20 and 20, the outcomes have remained very favorable with a complication rate of only 15%, an operative time that has remained stable at 110, blood loss at 150, reoperation about 2%, and a length of stay of five days with 0 30 days mortality. So, what is distal pancreatectomy in the landscape of the USA uh, as of 2018? Uh, the robotic approach is increasing. Uh, I would say more significantly than uh, the pancreatic odontectomy. Open is uh, declining, so is the laparoscopic approach. So it's it's reasonable to expect that in the last in the next decade, the robotic approach will be the predominant approach for uh, distal pancreatic resection in the proper patients. So I hope I gave you an overview of what the operation entails for this uh, distal pancreatectomy and pancreatic odontectomy, and most importantly, uh, what to expect from the surgical procedure in terms of outcome. Be happy to take any questions.
Yeah. No, I, I think that that was a terrific presentation and, and shows the uh, progress and evolution in surgical technique um, over the past 80 or 90 years since the Whipple operation was first uh, described and, and shows us a glimpse of what the future will be. Um, we're fortunate uh, to have with us as well, Mr. David Schott. Um, Mr. Schott is actually one of Dr. Zerkat's patients, I believe. Um, and Mr. Schott was uh, diagnosed with a pancreatic cancer. Um, at that time, uh, my understanding is it, it was deemed to be borderline resectable as Dr. Zerkat explained, there was some impingement of his tumor on one of the blood vessels. And so he did receive new adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, uh, responded very well to that and, and then underwent a successful operation, a Whipple type procedure by Dr. Zerkat. And uh, I think you can all see Mr. Schott there. You can see he looks vim and vigor, doing, doing quite well as, from what I understand. But uh, we're very grateful for your, your willingness to participate in our webinar this evening, Mr. Schott. Um, yeah, I think people in the audience would probably like to get a sense from you what the experience has been like, the receiving the diagnosis, the treatment you went through, um, concerns or questions you might've had when faced with the diagnosis, what your outlook was at that time and perhaps what your outlook is now. And we're just wondering if you could share some of your thoughts with us about that. Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be here tonight and share my, my story, my journey. Um, so it was almost um, three years to the day when I, uh, I noticed that my, my eyes were yellow and uh, obviously had uh, some level of jaundice. I was on my way to see Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes, one of my favorite bands, and uh, that got turned upside down and we ended up in the emergency room instead of at the concert hall. Um, after a few uh, scans, ultrasound, CT, et cetera, uh, actually went through a, an EUS procedure. Um, the, the mass on the head of my pancreas was confirmed as malignant. Um, there were a few lymph nodes in the region that were also suspected to be cancerous. Um, the later that was confirmed, uh, there were a total of 23 lymph nodes taken out during the procedure, three of which were, were cancerous. Um, but uh, again, three years ago, um, you know, I got that diagnosis and certainly no one wants to hear the, the C word and specifically not the pancreatic C word. Um, being an engineer by education, um, I immediately went to the internet to try to find out what this was all about. Um, quickly got into some of the statistics that probably paint a uh, dismal picture. And, you know, I, uh, I quickly got out of that mode because, uh, you know, if you get wrapped up in those numbers and the statistics and forget that you're your own individual case, you can end up in a dark place in a hurry. So I brushed aside the internet and started looking for other venues, other means of support, including PanCan, uh, Lust Garden. Uh, when we found out that I was a candidate for the Whipple surgery, my wife uh, joined the Whipple Warrior page on Facebook. Um, but I, I think most importantly, and I'll, and I'll say this, you know, in the context of hopefully there are some some patients on here. Um, I think the most important thing for me was to get my story out. Um, again, it's certainly a very private matter, but if you can get past that and share your story, you, you will find, I think in most cases, surprisingly that support finds you and you don't go looking for support. Um, perfect example, there were three people in my small hometown that had gone through pancreatic cancer or were still in the midst of the battle. Um, I was able to connect with them and learn an awful lot in a short amount of time that helped ease some of my fears. 
Um, nonetheless, um, my, my journey consisted of uh, two, two rounds of neoadjuvant therapy up front before the Whipple surgery. Um, it was actually part of a clinical trial at the university. Uh, it was gemabraxane combined with hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malaria drug, as well as uh, an immunotherapy drug. I did two cycles of that over the course of two months, um, September and October of 2018. In um, the middle of November of 2018, I underwent the robotic Whipple procedure at the hands of Dr. Zurichat. Um, and I mean, I, I try not to get emotional, but I mean, Dr. Zurichat obviously played uh, an unbelievable role in, in saving my life and my ability to be sitting here talking to you tonight. Um, he's an absolute wizard. Um, University of Pittsburgh is a recognized center of excellence and uh, I just can't say enough for the treatment that I got, not only with Dr. Zurichat, but everybody else involved. Um, you know, the, the length of stay that I endured after my Whipple was only four days. I went in on a Tuesday. I walked out of the hospital on a Saturday. Um, testament again to the, you know, the prowess of, of Dr. Zurichat in taking me apart and putting me back together. Uh, within approximately eight weeks after the Whipple, uh, I began adjuvant therapy, which was Fulfirinox. Um, I was told that I was looking at 12 rounds of uh, Fulfirinox treatment. And uh, my oncologist, uh, Dr. Nathan Bahari, said, Dave, if you get to eight rounds, we'll call it a day and we'll call it a victory. So I knew I was up against something that was uh, quite challenging, but I took it one, one cycle at a time and I got to two, I got to four, lo and behold, I got to eight and I said, I'm going for it and, and made it through all 12 rounds of full fear knocks. Um, it lasted from January of 2019 through July of 2019. Um, so currently, um, I'm about two years, a little, little over two years out from the end of chemotherapy. Um, it, it was a tough one, um, but I, again, I was determined to make it through. Um, I continued to work throughout um, everything, all the chemotherapy. I only took as much time as I needed off after the Whipple surgery to recover and get my strength back. Um, as far as complications from the surgery, I had very little, if any, um, a little bit of cholangitis presented itself, um, maybe about six months afterwards. Um, and that was rectified with a stint to help open up the bile duct. Um, uh, but beyond that, um, you know, hardly anything to speak of in terms of complications, um, the robotic procedure certainly helped my recovery time. Um, I was able to get back in eating solid food very quickly. I think within the span of um, three or four weeks, believe it or not, I was back to eating my favorite food, which is pizza. So all in all, um, you know, it was uh, an unbelievable experience, uh, again, at the hands of some amazing folks. Uh, Dr. Zurichat certainly at, at the top of the heap there. I uh, just can't say enough about what, what he did and continues to, to be part of my life as I move forward. Um, you know, I, I thank uh, everyone involved, um, you know, friends, family, et cetera. My wife in particular, Kim, who's sitting to my left, was my caregiver throughout. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it takes an army to get through this. There's no doubt about it. But that, that was kind of kind of my journey. Um, you know, just some quick facts and figures, if I recall correctly. Um, my tumor was, I think, at, at initial diagnosis, about 2.2 centimeters, plus or minus. Um, after I went through the neoadjuvant therapy, um, 
We did get some benefits from that. Uh, I believe Dr. Zurichat said the tumor shrank by approximately uh, 30%, again, plus or minus. So I think in my case, that may have improved um, what he saw when he went in to do the Whipple in terms of uh, creating some buffer between critical arteries and, and the tumor itself. Um, so uh, again, you know, just uh, just an overall incredible experience. I'm I'm very thankful to be here talking to you. So, how are things now compared to before surgery in terms of your your diet, your activities? Um, have those cha changed significantly? Any different medicines? Um, honestly, I I am back to in in my mind no no restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, I can eat anything. Um, granted, I have to take pancreatic enzymes, um, you know, when, when I do eat a meal, um, just to help me with, uh, with digesting the food, but, um, uh, there isn't anything that, you know, I, I really can not eat that I found is troublesome. Um, you know, I enjoy craft beer, unfortunately, and I've been able to get back and, and, uh, and enjoy that as well. Um, physical activity, um, no restrictions whatsoever. Um, I, I don't believe I'm hindered in any way at this point in my life uh, compared to uh, prior to, to the diagnosis and the surgery. Um, you offered some very good advice, I think, when you, you talked about people finding support and knowing that there is support out there. I, I suspect that when people hear a story, they're surprised. Uh, because most people don't think that anyone is around two years, three years after the diagnosis. And, and I'm sure you're an inspiration to others when they, they meet you and they hear your story. Yes, and um, you know, I am, I am certainly willing, as I told Trish uh, before we went live, that uh, I, am, I am more than happy to talk to anybody and everybody no matter what the stage of their journey, whether they just got diagnosed or they're, you know, headed for the Whipple or they're after the Whipple. Uh, I mean, I, I would love to talk to anybody that's willing to reach out to me. Trish has my contact information, phone number, email. Um, I will also offer that my wife is more than willing to talk from a caregiver perspective um, to anybody that needs that level of support. Well, that's extraordinarily generous of you. Um, I, I, I'm going a little off script. I saw she was in the corner of your screen. Do you think she would mind just speaking a little bit from the perspective of, of a family member? Because, you know, this is a, a difficult journey, not only for the individual who's afflicted, but, but for his or her family. Yeah. You know, I think everybody on here knows that um, your life's turned upside down you know, um, with those few words, you have pancreatic cancer. Um, I think the support that we had from all the doctors, the nurses, um, everyone at Hillman um, was, was truly amazing. And all the people that we've been in touch with through this journey, um, we have friends that I believe are on here now tonight in um, Texas, um, Andy and Jana um, are here that, talked with him, talked with me. It, it helps so much to talk to others uh, when you're going through this. Um, and it, it, it's huge to have support. Um, you need the support. Don't try to do it alone. Um, I, I think that's the, the biggest thing. Don't do it alone. Um, yeah, I mean, she, she served in a role, uh, multiple hats, obviously, my, my loving wife, um, caregiver, cheerleader. Uh, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, I, I won't get into it, but, but again, both myself and, and my wife, Kim, we're here for anybody on this call or anybody that's not on this call that, you know, need, needs, uh, some, some support or counseling, uh, you know, spread the word. And, um, uh, again, we're, we're happy to talk to anyone. No, well, well, thank you so much. I mean, that, that's so kind and generous of you. Um, I'll put in a, um, a brazen plug for the NPF as well. Uh, you know, this organization that, that Pat Bursick and Jane Holt established, uh, I guess about 20 years ago, 
I think that one of the primary missions of the MPF has been to provide support uh, to patients and their families, uh, to provide education, to support research. Um, I, we heard at the very beginning from Trish what the mission, uh, she read off the mission statement. And so in addition to friends and family, uh, the MPF I think is always there. Um, and so I just wanna put a plug in for the MPF. Yeah, I know, I know we've run long. Um, we still have about 30 or so people, including the panelists on. Um, for anyone who might have questions, uh, I'm sure you know, all of us will, will be happy to stay on a bit longer if there are any, any questions that, or comments any of you might have. I think, uh, Dr. Lee, there's one question from uh, a Whipple patient um, who was asking, uh, I recently had the Whipple 11 weeks ago. Uh, um, when does the abdomen settle down and life return to near normal? Uh, daily nausea and abdominal pain. What would you say, Dr. Lee, 11 weeks after a Whipple? You know, 11 weeks, it, it is a gradual process. And I, and I think it's... I think it's important for us as the surgeons to um, to coach and encourage our patients, um, but also to reassure them that things don't change overnight. I mean, for Mr. Schott, he, he was on a, a more rapid trajectory. Um, but I think to reassure our patients, if they step back and ask themselves, how do I feel this week compared to last week? How do I feel this week compared to two or three weeks ago? And I've always felt that, that if my patients are continuing to make progress, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, it's, it's a big operation. It's, it's very traumatic to our bodies. Um, so I, I would just try to reassure that individual that um, hopefully he's better now than he was a month ago, and that will continue. I, I tell people it'll take three to six months before they necessarily move back to where how they felt before the operation. Um, we often tell people don't do strenuous exercise or heavy lifting. Historically, for open operations, for about six to eight weeks, and then I, but I would tell people even though you're allowed to do things in six to eight weeks, it's probably going to be another six to eight weeks before you can feel like you can do everything. Uh, what would be your your feeling about that, Dr. Zerkat or Dr. Panicia? Alessandro, what do you think? Yeah, I share your same recommendation. I say, in general, I tell patients three months before they start uh, functioning again normal. Now, some of that is recovery. Other times is an issue with pancreatic insufficiency. Some of the symptoms that she describes with nausea and, and pain sometimes has to do with inability to really digest well food. So if that a particular individual participant is not currently on a, a pancreatic replacement enzyme is, is a consideration, but mostly talk with, with the surgeon who did the operation, which might have some additional insight. Other issue that present in that manner is some delayed gastric emptying that, that can persist even beyond the immediate recovery time. So a patient can be able to eat solid, but the stomach just takes longer to empty. So there are some medication that can be useful for that matter too. So in general, a, a good evaluation can most of the time come down to the root of the problem and a solution can be found. But I agree with you, it's a gradual process. Uh, it's not, yes, the discharge from the hospital is in five, six, seven days, but most of the recovery occurs at home. And, and it will take time. And it obviously doesn't help that most of the time chemotherapy then is given on the back end. And that's where Dr. Zorica was alluding at the beginning. It's hard to tolerate the chemotherapy post WIPO because there are little issues that compound and become a, a problem to face. I think we all give the uh, WIPO pep talk uh, about, you know, a month or two after the operation. It's hard. It's just it's a long journey. Um, David was like Superman, but uh, it's uh, you know it's hard for most patients. You know, robotic or open, it's it, it's the same organs that are removed every single time. So it is pretty traumatic. Uh, but at eleven weeks, I think you know, uh, as Alessandro was saying, um, enzymes may be an issue. I think it, it, it's right around that time period that if you're not slowly improving which you should be, if you're slowly improving that, that's good. It's gonna take a few more weeks, sometimes up to six months. But if 
not improving, then, you know, definitely discuss with your surgeon the possibility that, you know, other medications can be used or sometimes a, a test to look at the anatomy, make sure the anatomy is good. There's no ulcers. There's no, you know, strictures or blockages. You heard there, David had a blockage in his bile duct that needed a stent afterwards, six months after the operation. So th these things do happen. Um, but certainly around the 11 week mark, if you're not improving, I would uh, just uh, revisit the surgeon one more time and, uh, and uh, get down to the root of the problem. Are there any other questions or comments that anyone on the webinar might have? Uh, you know, if not, we want to, I want to extend a thanks to all of you for participating, uh, especially to Mr. Shad and his wife uh, for sharing their, their journey and their experience. Uh, that's extraordinarily valuable for other people to hear about. Um, again, uh, extend thanks to the National Pancreas Foundation, which as I said earlier, it's just an extraordinary uh, in, invaluable resource. And for any of you who may be afflicted by or know anyone afflicted by pancreatic disease, um, I encourage you to, to go to the NPF website. Uh, it's, it just provides a wealth of information as a wonderful resource. Um, and just like Mr. Shad and his wife, uh, I know Dr. Zerkat, Dr. Panichi and I would, would also be happy uh, to speak to any of you if, if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us in, in, and we can be sure that uh, Trish and others at the NPF have our contact information. So again, uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. I think that this was just a, a wonderful um, uh, opportunity to, to share information and, and to learn more about this. And I hope it was beneficial to all of you. So thank you and, and, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Okay. Everyone can leave now. <laughs> <laughs>